So good morning, everyone. So glad that you could join us today uh, for our latest installment in Shop Chats. This is just an opportunity for us to talk about a marketing or communications type of a topic um, and to bring some really smart people that we know uh, to the table to have part of that conversation. And we're glad that you all could join us. Um, first of all, I just want to make a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, we will end promptly within an hour today. There will be a recording of today's session available um, if you'd like to go back to it or if uh, for some reason you need to drop off or you'd like to share it with other colleagues. We'd love for you to do that. Uh, we'll also have a summary blog that we'll post in our Borshoff channels. Um, and everyone today has joined muted. So if you wanna make sure that you stay muted, if you have questions throughout though, we do want this to be a conversation. Um, and so if you have questions or just observations, things that you wanna share, if you will uh, go ahead and send us a note in the chat, I will try to facilitate all of those and bring those questions to our speakers today. And we can kind of go from there. Um, so I think those are the main things. What I'd like to do now is just introduce our speakers. Um, I'm Catherine Koble and I am one of the partners here at Borshoff. Um, and the, the two speakers that we have today, I'm very, very excited about. I'm, I'm really glad that they could join us. Uh, the first person that I wanna introduce is Jennifer Deswaner. She is a partner here at Borshoff. Um, and she's really a, a powerhouse in the PR scene here um, in the Indianapolis area, along with our second speaker, uh, Denise Hurd. So just a little bit of background on, on these two. Um, Jennifer has really been active in counseling clients in a number of crisis situations for, for many, many years. Um, she has worked on some fairly high profile things and then also some things that are very behind the scenes. And I'm sure she'll talk about some of those today. She has over 25 years of experience as a professional communicator, and that's really run the spectrum. She's worked with global companies, um, international marketing communications uh, programs, um, industries such as pharmaceuticals, cultural organizations, and infrastructure. So she's really spanned uh, the full spectrum. Um, so welcome, Jennifer. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Um, also, second, I would like to introduce Denise Hurd, and Denise is the president of Hurd Strategies. Um, Hurd Strategies has really developed a reputation for being the go-to firm in town for some innovative marketing, uh, problem solving, public relations, community outreach, all sorts of great uh, services and capabilities that they offer. Um, but outside of her business, Denise is a very highly sought after public speaker, a workshop facilitator, um, and she's really well known for her commitment to various Indianapolis community initiatives. Um, and one of the things I love about Denise is her commitment to really growing the next generation of communications profession professionals working um, as an adjunct instructor and a great mentor. So uh, appreciate all of that. Thank you, Denise, for joining us today, too. Thank you so much. Thank you. So just to get started, I thought it would be great to set a little bit of context for everyone on um, really you, you two work for different firms, um, but you've partnered in some pretty unique ways over the last couple of years um, to take on some pretty big PR challenges. Um, so I'd kind of like to start with that and just have you ladies tell us a little bit more about how you found your way to each other and what kinds of things that you're really working on together. Sure. So um, I'll take that one if you don't mind. So um, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all this morning. And um, thank you to the Borshoff team for inviting me to participate in this shop chat about this very, very important topic. So you asked, you know, how did we find each other? You know, I think that both of our firms are firm believers that there's strength in numbers, that when we collaborate, we get our best work and we can achieve our best work. And we can, you know, bounce ideas off of one another and just really, like I say, play the tape to the end when it comes to our communication strategies. And so, you know, for our firm, and I think also for the Borshoff team, uh, most of our clients are predominantly white and they may have some diversity on their staffs, but not a lot. And a lot of times consultants have to say difficult things and people are more receptive to believe things that they hear from people that look like them. So it's important that we have diverse thoughts or diverse consultants coming in to address a client's needs because um, a lot of times we have to say things that they don't wanna hear, but that they need to hear. 
Um, also, I think it also ensures that the information that they're receiving, like I said, is played to the end. You know, they're getting Jen, they're getting me, and they're getting a um, kind of a merger of our two perspectives on things. And we can guide them. And I think the other thing is that neither one of us wants to be pigeonholed. We don't want our firms to be pigeonholed. I don't want to be labeled as, oh, she's just an MBE firm. I'm more than that. And Borshop, I'm sure, doesn't want to be labeled as just a crisis firm. They're more than that. And so that's why coming together is like we're just greater than the sum of our different parts. So I think that's the beauty of the relationship that we have and coming together. I'll add to that just to say this, um, Denise and I have been working along together on, on a number of things and, uh, and this was her idea, which was an awesome idea. She said, you know, we could tell other people about this. We could, we could share this. And I think we had to do it a little bit before we were uh, more confident in this conversation. Um, but totally agreeing with what um, Denise said and also saying, you will know over the course of the next hour, we don't have all of the answers. Um, we are uh, very confident in our skills as communicators and as crisis counselors, but this is hard stuff. Um, these are a lot of challenging uh, situations, a lot of challenging conversations, and um, no one has seen it all. Every time the phone rings, it's kind of a different issue. And what is a crisis keeps evolving? And that's not just a 2020, 2021 thing um, that is uh, throughout time, which not everybody loves crisis communications. I do, but not everybody does. And I had to realize that not everybody in PR wants to do this kind of work. Um, but what I found uh, my friend Denise did and that we could be, we are greater than the sum of our parts. Um, and, and I think it is, um, we both have great uh, teams who work with us, but we also um, are very much on the same page. Um, and when we're not, we can talk about it mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. and really come to different, um, you know, each bring our, our thoughts or our questions and then uh, present something united to the client. Um, but, but that idea of what is a crisis constantly evolving um, keeps us um, on our toes. <laughs> and it means that we're constantly having to tailor, um, you know, different, different answers for different situations. But our collaborations have made us better um, than, uh, than we have been. And, um, we hope it's, yeah, it's benefited others who work with us. That's great. So just to get a little bit even clearer, as we mentioned in the title of our shop chat today, we really do want to talk about, uh, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion ideas, um, and those kinds of situations that sometimes become a crisis situation and how to handle that. And so as I was thinking about this topic, I was thinking, you know, working with clients who are in crisis, that can just be scary enough as it is. Um, it's very fast moving. You have to make some decisions pretty quick. When you are first approached by a client who basically comes to you and says, um, we, have a, we have a situation, it involves diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, and we need help. Um, how do you evaluate what makes for a good client um, in those kinds of situations? Because I'm guessing, you know, you really don't have a whole lot of time. You have to make a decision on whether or not you're going to go down this path with this client pretty quickly before you really have the whole story. So how do, how do you evaluate what makes for a good client in this situation, um, especially when they need you immediately? Well, I'll say that for one, very rarely do they position it as we have a DEI issue. They usually just call and say, help, we've, we've got a situation. Um, you know, they haven't quite characterized it that way um, for one thing. And I think that what we're looking for in that first conversation is what is the nature of it? Do they want real help um, to, to get through it and to learn and to grow through it? And it doesn't mean that they have to say, you know, we're horribly guilty and we did everything wrong. It's not that, but you can tell in a first conversation if somebody is in a completely defensive posture or if they're completely saying, I need you to fix this. I mean, you all know a lot of you are communicators. Anybody who comes and says, I need you to spin this. I need you to fix this. I need you to, you know, that is um, a red flag in a lot of ways. But especially with these kind of issues, um, I will say that a lot of what we're seeing is the acute issue at hand may be what they're bringing to us, but as soon as we get beneath that, things have been simmering for a long time, things have been happening for a long time, 
Um, and one thing I think is we uh, assess a situation, which you know sometimes it's right in that first call, but others it's in a couple of meetings, is we're looking for patterns. A lot of times organizations can easily see things as isolated events that had nothing to do with each other and maybe different people were involved, but we're seeing it as a pattern. And again, that's not to damn any organization. It's just to say these things could be more linked and we need to do some assessing of how can we get out of this together? And one last thought on that is we're very interested in um, helping organizations get through it and be better on the other side. And there are some organizations that um, you know, people have said, my gosh, why would you work with them after what they've done? But the reality is, is we as a community need great businesses and great organizations to be their highest functioning selves. Um, and so if we can do anything to help them do that, that's very rewarding. No, that's, that is so true. That is so true. But it, you know, sometimes it's hard. And I think as communicators, we often forget that the word no is okay. You know, um, I think one of the greatest pieces of advice I've ever been given in my career is Denise, no is a blessing, not even, not just to you, but to the people that are asking you to help them. You know, and if you go back and just dial it back to the textbook, one of the values in our code of ethics is advocacy. So you have to be able to stand shoulder to shoulder with that client or that particular, you know, potential client that is having a crisis and lead them through that crisis and understand that you will be aligned with that organization while you're leading them through that crisis. And so while there is that separation because, you know, we're just coming in for a fixed period of time, during that time, you are working with them and you are supporting their values. You're, su you're not, you are, um, you are working with them through this, this crisis that they're having and you are guiding them in the public domains, in the public sector. So it's very important that you, we, you know, I think we all agree that we have to be aligned with them and be able to advocate. I think also knowing who will I be working with, there's, a, it's very important that, you know, in a crisis, who will I have access to? You know, is it the CEO? You know, is it the board chair? Who in leadership is going to be involved? Because, you know, as you know, in solving a crisis, it does start at the top. So making sure I understand who's going to be involved in and their level of involvement. And then the other thing, you know, and I think that we all go through this when we're dealing with a crisis or when someone approaches us with a crisis, do they have an understanding of the seriousness of this problem? Because sometimes I think that some, they don't really, they're looking at the surface or looking at just what's staring them, what they're staring at immediately, but do they understand the many layers of their organization are going to be impacted or have been impacted by this crisis that they're just looking at from a, almost a, a, a top level perspective? I'll add here too that Denise and I have spent a lot of time offline talking about, um, you know, how we approach different things. And each of our agencies has been through our own crises. Um, so we are not above this by any means. And we've been through things that, um, you know, you, you try to find those silver linings when you're going through it. But one of them is, is that I do think I've had more sympathy um, because mm -hmm. I think as a counselor, sometimes if you stay two arms length with it, you don't realize what it's like when it is your organization that's in the vortex mm -hmm. and when you're really going through it and you can start to doubt a lot of things. And I think some learnings in that have, I hope made me a better counselor. And I know mm -hmm. Denise, you've said the same, but it's like, you know, own it early, don't go into denial mode, face the music, make tough decisions, and try to, be, you have to be better coming out of it. If you take all of that pain and you don't learn from it and you don't gain, it is um, worse. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of, of helping people, but it's made me um, just more attuned to what it's like mm -hmm. when you're the one. Oh yeah, there's nothing like, because you're right, it does create a level of, of empathy, if you will. You know, we, like you said, you've gone through a crisis. We too have gone through the crisis, a crisis and actually worked with a couple of people who are in this shop chat right now who are communicators and PR practitioners that wrap themselves around us to guide us through the crisis because you know it's difficult and so it also it, and you're right it did create a level of empathy because you know we give advice and we're like you should not do this but now when you're on the receiving end and someone's telling you it's a different viewpoint 
So to be able to understand that and bring that level of experience to the table just makes you a better practitioner and a better deliverer of your services. Yeah, that's great. That's really great. So I just want to pause for a moment here and remind everyone that if you have a question, you want to share, share something, please put that in the chat and we will definitely bring those to the forefront. And so kind of to a point that you made earlier, Denise, where you were talking about, um, you know, uh, making sure that people are really open to the counsel that you're giving. Mm -hmm. I think that oftentimes we find ourselves as, as particularly when we're in a crisis mode with the client, um, talking to them about the operational ramifications of a situation. We can fix things from a communications to be clearer or to be specific about a particular situation, that's that's our role as communicators, but we can't really fix those operational issues that might have driven that problem. But we often find ourselves um, in some respects, you know, bringing those to their attention and, and encouraging them to fix those things. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, you all have told me before, you're not, you're not DEI consultants per se, you're communicators. Um, but where does that line get blurry? And especially when you're in the heat of a crisis, how do you try to manage all of that? <laughs> you want it? So I think she can... said your name. Oh, <laughs> okay. So, so something I, you know, thank you for that question because that is a really good one. So here's the thing I often think about because I am black, people think that when I come in, I'm the silver bullet, like I can fix it. And I look at them like, no, like this is bigger than me. I'm here as a communicator. And yes, I may have a, a different level of understanding, but I'm not your solution. I am not your solution. The solution lies within your organization. I'm not coming in to solve that because once again, I'm here to help you with your communications. And so I often advise clients like, you know, after I do my assessment, that maybe not only do you need me, you need a DEI consultant to come in and help you. You need some professional development in this arena to help you. And I can help you with your messaging as you're, you're working through that. So I think that's the, the big thing. I, and I think also going into it, we do a lot of listening, a lot of listening. And um, the whole, like what's in it for me, you know, I want to make sure that the organizations understand that when they work through this and um, they they go through this process, it really isn't about what's in it for them. It's what's in it for the end user or the community. So it's like often shifting their perspective or their focus, you know, because in a crisis, everyone's focused on you got to make it go away. You got to fix it, make it go, you know, solve it. But it's really not about you. It's about the people that you have impacted as a result of your action. So that's the other thing, but I, I just really think, you know, realizing that I'm not your solution, I'm a part of helping you on your journey, but you may need real, real professionals to come in and assess your situation, do those cultural audits, write those DEI strategies to get you on the right path. Because just because I fixed your communications, if you still, are symptomatic of this illness that you have where DEI is concerned, there's no level of communication that's gonna cover that up. It's still gonna bubble to the surface. Yeah, one of those great phrases we've heard and every crisis person has used it is, I can't communicate our way out of what you behaved your way into. Um, and, mm -hmm. and a lot of people are looking at the marketing and comms people at the organizations that we work with and saying, you guys need to fix this. And so they're coming to us and saying, you know, you guys need to fix this. And you need to kind of follow that chain and say, you know, as Denise said, we really try to stay in our lane in terms of, you know, what is the communications and marketing piece um, that we can, uh, you know, have some effect on. Um, but yeah, that there are, there are usually other things that have to change within an organization in order to make those messages better. You cannot just have messages. The messages have to be backed up by reality um, and what's really going to make something better for an organization. Um, and a lot of these issues are very internal. Um, I'll say that too. You know, a lot of these are um, the DEI um, issues are very much about um, an internal workforce issue, employee to employee issues, supervisor to employee issues um, all across the board. And um, I think that's just, a, it's, a, it's another level, you know, as communicators, it's another level of pain um, when it's colleague to colleague. And so a lot of times we're working on those things. And as Denise said, we need 
other HR and DEI experts to help um, really make those long-term fixes. Um, but we do need to say the right things internally. Um, that is, these are not just all external end up in the media kind of situations. So I want to come back to that, but before we even do that, I would love for the two of you to really set the foundation for us of, let's talk a little bit about process and kind of the tactical route to, to getting through a crisis and really any crisis, but particularly a, a crisis that involves a DEI issue. Um, what's the process that you tend to go through when you first engage with a, with a, with a client? You mentioned you know, a lot of listening, but talk to us a little bit about kind of that chronology of how you do what you do uh, to get to a solution. I'll say the, the quick kind of bullet point list in some ways is yes, as Denise said, listening, listening, listening. And we're we need people, it, you had mentioned early on, Catherine, that we have to get up to speed quickly and make quick decisions. That is true. It's also hard to be the client in a lot of these because they have to trust us pretty quickly too. Um, they, you know, we need people to not hold back on information um, and that's difficult. Um, and so we need people to tell us the full story. Um, we've seen where we can watch people's burdens just kind of be lifted when they can tell the full story for the first time because they've put on such a good face, either for their internal or external audiences, but they need to be able to be honest with us, to trust us, um, and to admit to themselves, um, and, and we have to look at that to say we cannot fix something if we can't see the problem. You know, we just, it's not fixable. Um, and so we're assessing right from the beginning, we're trying to bring immediate counsel. I mean, sometimes on that first phone call, we're not holding back until, you know, sort of, you know, till you pay us kind of thing. We really are, we can't help ourselves but to start kind of giving um, immediate advice on some things. Um, but then we're making recommendations, we're drafting messages, we're reviewing and getting messages approved and then um, distributed. And some of these are fairly quick. I mean, some of them really do come and go. We had really one funny one the other day. There was a crisis in the morning. And by the time the client came here to meet with us in the afternoon, they're like, oh, no, it's good. We're solved. We're like, oh, OK, great. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Um, that is not the norm. Um, and some of these um, you know, last for a few days, weeks. And some of them, once you're peeling that onion, they last for months. Um, a lot of times it's a roller coaster though. They get better, they get worse, they get better, they get worse depending on the situation. Um, but it's the last thing I'll say, um, and Denise, please jump in, is sometimes these become a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Like we are two people at this table, but a lot of times there's legal counsel, there's internal legal counsel, there's out, outside legal, there's a, there are DEI experts um, as we've mentioned. And so sometimes it's kind of a small army um, helping to solve these issues. And that is usually a blessing, uh, but it can be a challenge. So that's a good point. Um, those are, so interestingly, um, what's, no one wants, this is like dicey stuff. If you think about it, anything that labels you as a something, you know, whether you be homophobic or racist or you're not sensitive to gender. I mean, like these are delicate topics and no one, no one wants that label on them and no one wants to be accused of being that. So you're already in a, but I'm not that way or you're defensive. And so my thing is, I just want to come in and have a very candid conversation to you because we have to get to the root of the problem. We, I mean, so and as Jen said, you know, and we do a lot of listening. And for me, I'm, it's almost like not what you said, what you didn't say is what I'm tuning into. Like what wasn't said or what, what haven't you expressed during this conversation that we're having together? Like, have you expressed any level of remorse? Have you expressed any level of regret? You know, like, do I hear that coming through when we're talking to, enough, to one another? Um, I think a part of this process also is, um, and, and we all know this, taking copious notes, you know, and, do, and that's why you're doing more listening rather than talking, because you know, if you're talking, you can't take notes. But if you're listening, you can, and you can write down those key words or those key messages that you heard from the person that you're speaking with. And, you know, because what I want to do is make sure I hear that story from A to Z. 
before I interject anything. Because once I interject, they're gonna focus on trying to give me the answer that they think I want to hear. And so I want to hear their entire story uninterrupted and see and get an, a, a clear understanding of what it is we're, we're facing. And then we can go in and ask the questions and then try and craft a strategy from there. But that's, that's kind of our process. That's a really good point about not um, influencing the client's uh, thinking from that perspective of, you know, from you making a judgment call about them. I think that would be a very important thing to be very careful of and very aware of early on in the conversation, especially. Um, okay, we do have a question that I want to share uh, from Courtney Taylor. The question is, have you seen an increase in DEI situations arising from social media posts, um, from employees, stakeholders, et cetera? And how do you navigate something that might go viral? So let's talk a little bit about that digital angle, because I'm sure that is part of everything you guys are thinking about. Amen. <laughs> where, where to even start? I know you all know too. So yeah, thank you. Um, yes, uh, social media is extremely challenging. Um, I like to think that it can be both a blessing and a curse. Um, I like to think that it could also help you sometimes when you can get some good messaging out there on social or have you, you've seen these. I know when it's a crisis and you get people piling on, but then you have other people who kind of come to the defense or the rescue of that organization too. And I know some of you on this call have been through those where you're always making a judgment of, do I jump in or do I lay back? And do I, do I make it worse by jumping in? And a lot of times I think we are talking people out of engaging um, in a lot of social that to let things play out, to let them run their course, partly because they can run their course very quickly sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, the attention span is super short. Um, and even if you try to take down comments and do this and stop it, it kind of lives forever. And then people make an issue of your taking down the comments or of starting this. And this is such a hard case by case situation though. Um, and it of course is not just DEI issues, but all crisis issues, mm -hmm. um, but we have definitely seen, and, and you know, no one, I hope this goes without saying, but we've seen issues like no one should be doing um, drunk posting, no one should be doing late night posting. If you are, don't have your full faculties and uh, are, and if someone else reading it might question it, yeah, have somebody else read it before you post it, especially on any kind of um, official sites. But we are also seeing that merging of the uh, personal and the professional, mm -hmm. meaning people are looking at your personal and making a professional judgment about you. So you got to mm -hmm. be consistent with that too. No, that's a, that's a really good question because the other thing, you know, think about the cornerstone of what we do is the First Amendment. And, you know, where defamation laws were written, social media is a new medium within the law. And so there are still, and so attorneys are very gray also on how to handle libel, you know, as it pertains to social media. And so there's all that ambiguity that we're facing as PR practitioners in crisis in social media that the, that, you know, legal analysts are trying to sort through. So our counsel, just like, you know, Jennifer said is we normally advise clients don't engage because once you engage, things are now escalated. And as painful, as painful as it is, it is short-lived. Social media posts, it, it can be short-lived. It can, you know, dissipate. But I know it's so painful going through the process, but it does come to an end. So we, we encourage not to engage and to, and, and we've even encouraged people to encourage their supporters not to engage because all that does is keep the conversation going. So that's a thought as well. I would think it would also, uh, something else that you would want to take into consideration is the, the voice that you already have before the crisis. And if you mm -hmm. are the kind of organization that isn't actually super involved in responding and you don't, there's not really kind of a personality to, or there's a very conservative personality to your voice and your past responses to anything not crisis related, if you suddenly start responding to every little thing during a crisis, that that would obviously look odd and, and wouldn't really be in keeping with your brand as well. So that might mm -hmm. be something to think about. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, go ahead, Jennifer. Do you have another um, comment on that? 
so many things on this, <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll, I'll say one thing that just jumped to mind because we have seen it across a number of different crises is that a lot of times the vo another angle on voice is who is jumping to your defense because some, we've seen in a number of occasions where somebody wants to make a situation right and come to their defense, but I'll be general about this, it's all white people coming to their defense. And we needed, we need voices of color to, to speak and to say that, but that's not who's weighing in. And there could be a variety of reasons. It may not be, you know, just as clear as, oh, that's just not how they feel about it. Some people, as you know, are just not eager to jump in on social and make their opinions known. And other people are very bold about that. And so that's also a, you know, another layer to this. And we've seen this, we've seen it with colleges and universities. We've seen it with arts and culture organizations. Um, but a lot where um, the voices who are coming to your defense are not helping the situation. So, but that's that's actually insightful though, because you know a lot of times organizations think that they have the voice of of, of minority audiences, and they you know, they yeah they support us they support us, and then if, if in a crisis and you take to social media and you don't see that public coming in to defend you, that's valuable insight that you should pay attention to, you know, as Jennifer said, like who is supporting you on social media? And if it's not the, the audience that you, you know, have infringed upon or, or hurt, then that lets you know that the problem that you are facing runs much deeper than, you, than the crisis that you're encountering at that moment in time. I'll also add something else again. We could probably talk just social media the rest of the time. <laughs> but um, a lot of times it's very upsetting and discouraging um, to see the negative comments, but they're really coming from very few people. So that's also a perspective that we try to bring to is to try to see how many people are really engaged in this conversation. And if it's a few vocal people, um, those numbers matter. And it doesn't mean that that isn't painful and it doesn't mean that it's not real. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of times it can feel as if it's uh, millions against you when really it's, it's very few and, and that's helpful. Great perspective. Um, okay, so Olivia also has another question that I wanted to bring to you all. Um, what challenges have you seen regarding DEI communications around COVID? Do you feel that uh, you've been able to successfully manage and navigate these types of communications during this time? Anything special because of COVID that you guys have seen? Doing everything by Zoom, as you well know, as we are sitting here today, um, is just, it's got its pros and its cons, I will say that. I think we have um, had some really, I think we've learned over because this has gone on so long to have some really, difficult and sticky conversations in an, a remote environment, which we didn't used to have. I mean, it used to be that you would kind of, uh, you know, maybe do something on the phone, but then you would really get together if you had to um, have a real eyeball to eyeball. Um, there are some on this call I've worked with for long periods before we ever saw each other in person. And that is just so strange, um, but it didn't make it less of a relationship. And I think that's been a real learning um, I think the, uh, I think, you know, DEI is just one piece of that, but I would say um, also making assumptions, organizations making assumptions about how different populations feel without getting real data and figures on it um, has been a challenge as well. Uh, people were making generalizations about uh, people showing up to or not showing up um, to, to either have their camera on, not camera on, um, wanting to engage and we've encouraged organizations to go get real data on that um, and not make, um, let's say, inclusion uh, assumptions about certain groups um, because of the remote aspect, uh, just adding another layer of complexity. No, I think, yeah, I think all of that. And I also think how we address these issues of DEI is, has really been impacted by COVID is because, you know, Back in the olden days in 2019, when we could be in a room together, um, it's changed. And so if there's a problem and you need to meet with the community, you could just do a community meeting or you can have one on ones with key stakeholders and, you know, do that relationship building and that problem solving. And now 
it's so different. You know, it's, it's hard to convene people in the way that we used to be able to when there was a crisis and we were trying to reestablish public trust uh, for organizations and for clients. So I think that COVID has really forced us all, all of us, you know, in this conversation right now to rethink our approach to how we communicate. But the, I don't wanna say the beauty, but the interesting thing about COVID, and I know you all can understand this, is that it leveled the playing field for everyone. Everyone has been impacted by COVID and everyone has had to readdress how they handle all issues and you know, and then I think also along with COVID, we have a heightened sense of awareness because of the unrest that we experienced last year as well. So I think that while these are unfortunate situations that happened, they have been a game changer in dealing with matters of DEI because it's at the forefront of everyone's mind right now. I'll add two more thoughts to that too, as you were talking, Denise. I was thinking that one is. Um, we have seen organizations engage with their audiences, and this is particularly DEI audiences, better during remote. They could do remote. In other words, it was so hard, and I'll use just an example, but moms of young children who are working to try to get time off to like come to a focus group or to you know volunteer on a committee or something like that, always challenging. Add COVID on top of it, super challenging. And so organizations figured out a way to get a remote group and oh my gosh, the turnout was better. Like mm -hmm. people were willing to log on. Now, obviously you've got some connectivity issues and some, you know, there are, there are certainly with some audiences, not everybody has equal uh, computer and Wi-Fi access and everything. Mm -hmm. But if you can get to a certain point where we saw um, community organizations engage better with some DEI groups because people could just log on and let me give you 30 minutes and give you my thoughts and then go back to my kids and my work. Mm -hmm. What a difference. And I'm really hoping that's a, you know, a silver lining mm -hmm. in a lot of this um, is, is more engagement uh, from some groups that it was just real, really, really, really hard to reach before. Yeah, that's a really great point. So I want to go back to something that you started down the path of <clears throat> before, Jennifer. Um, when, when a DEI crisis hits, some organizations focus heavily on the external or the reputation part of the crisis. Um, can you speak a little bit about managing a crisis from the inside to the outside and what's critical to keep in mind for those internal audiences? Um, I think a couple of things just to add to what I said before is one, your internal audience is your most important. And so often they get kind of skipped or we get so obsessed with the media or what some outside stakeholder group thinks um, that we forget to inform our employees. Um, we've had some conversations recently where people were saying, yeah, I think we we have not always shared our messaging with our employees at all. It really went from a communications or marketing team directly either to the media or to some to the board even or to some other group. Um, some people have left their boards off. That's another internal audience that has not always brought into the fold. The board's been out there just kind of doing their thing and, um, and they thought they didn't want to bother the board with it. And we are big advocates of share those messages with everyone. Everyone is, this is a fairly small town as you know. Um, and, and community and people need to be equipped with what can we say about this situation? Because obviously not only are your employees your best ambassadors, they can also be your worst nightmare um, when they are out there just saying anything they wanna say or they have half information. So equipping people, we've seen employees respond very positively and we use, um, you know, as you're, many of you are familiar with holding statements, give everybody a holding statement, something they could say about it. Um, and if it's that we're looking into it, or it's that we've heard this, or that we're working on fixing, or that we're going to do this review, we're engaging consultants, whatever it is, um, have a holding statement. Um, that That's the kind of thing we help people with. And also clarify who's going to be the spokesperson on this, um, because it is also uh, surprising when some organizations um, have let all different people um, all speak either internally or externally on an issue and we really need to have defined spokespersons and credible spokespersons um, which is part of what we can help with too. Mm -hmm. I don't have anything to add. All right. I think you summed it up. <laughs> <laughs> That's great and I think also like you were talking about with a spokesperson um, sometimes the CEO isn't necessarily the right spokesperson 
right? So talk a little bit about that, about who makes for the right spokesperson and is it sometimes different externally versus internally? Yeah, one, one this is not a, a DEI crisis, but I always use it partly because I have the clients, I've had the client's permission to use this one um, before, but we work with um, a lot of utilities and um, there were these, you know, uh, underground manhole issues going on a number mm -hmm. of years ago outstanding CEO in terms of ability to speak to the media and to represent the company, except that once you've got this kind of an issue going on, it was so much better to have the head of engineering who actually goes in the manholes and inspects them. And I just use that as such a clear example to me of that's who we needed to be reassuring people. Mm -hmm. The CEO in that case was less reassuring because you know that person sitting a degree or two removed mm -hmm. um, from what's actually going on and you need it and we, you know, we don't want to insult the public. So we're trying to give them the real answers to what's actually going on um, under mm -hmm. the manhole. Once you want to start talking about some of those technical issues, great to have that credible spokesperson. Mm -hmm. I am, I'm going to sound really old when I say this, but my, um, I don't know what word I'm looking for, my pulse check or my the person that I use as the guide as to whether or not the CEO or someone else is the CEO of Johnson & Johnson during the Tylenol scare. I mean, if those of you all that are, are a little more seasoned may remember when that, because that was a game changer yeah. for us, it, it, for public relations, when the Tylenol capsules were being um, tampered with and uh, they ended up having to take the, the Tylenol uh, product off the shelves nationwide. And the CEO from Johnson & Johnson was the spokesperson during that entire crisis and was just absolutely brilliant in how he turned the tide and, you know, reestablished public trust. And I think many of us on this conversation today have Tylenol in our, in our cabinets right now because he was just such an outstanding spokesperson for the organization. So if you don't measure up to him, we need someone else. Or I'm, you know, I'm kind of teasing a little bit, but he was just a great example of how a CEO can be a wonderful, wonderful spokesperson. And some CEOs are great CEOs, but not great spokespeople. Right. I mean, it's just a different role. And so you really do have to get in and we do media training for that reason to try to get everybody mm -hmm. to a certain bar. But there are um, you know, people who are just, yeah, you know, more reassuring than others mm -hmm. in, in a crisis or really get it. We've done some assessments, and this is definitely true with some DEI crises we've been involved with, where we were in essence assessing who's really got this in their heart and gut mm -hmm. and soul and could speak to this. Because if you feel like you were just reading some messages and you're mm -hmm. not really sure that this is how you feel about this, wrong spokesperson. Mm -hmm. Like we really have to get somebody who uh, believes this in their whole soul. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, uh, you know, so it mm -hmm. takes a while sometimes for people to get there. And I imagine that there are probably times when you have uh, counseled that a certain person shouldn't be the spokesperson and oh, you got yes. pushback on that. Did you get pushback? Um, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. But here's the thing, you, you brought me in to help you through this. So this is my counsel to you. And so, but then also I will say that if the decision is made not to take our counsel, then my response normally is within let's make sure we have a plan set up for the pushback we're about to experience in going in this direction, you know, because we're giving you advice that we think is best. You don't want to take that advice. So let's make sure we've got a communication plan in place for the fallout. We, I had a crisis many years ago now, but it still lives in my mind always that I think it was the choice of spokesperson that was its downfall. Mm. Um, but honestly, no one else would step up. And so it was against my counsel. It was against my judgment. I kept saying it needed, you know, to be mm -hmm. someone else, but look, no one else stepped into that void. Mm -hmm. And so this person put it on their shoulders and carried it, but it was, yeah, not, not helpful. It was already a tough situation. It, it wasn't just about the spokesperson, but at the same time, that spokesperson did not help it. Mm -hmm. um, but for those of you out there who could be the great spokesperson, please, you know, do it, step mm -hmm. up and do it. It's hard. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, it can be um, very rewarding and help the organization greatly when you have the right person mm -hmm. delivering the message. Mm -hmm. That's great. So I have one other thought I want to explore on that topic. And then I do have another question from Joe, but we'll get, we'll get to that in just a second. But 
along these same lines, have you all found times when the client really is insistent that you serve as the spokesperson? And how do you feel about that versus someone that's actually in the organization? <laughs> so we do not serve as the spokesperson. Um, cause uh, you know, no, the, you know, the answer is no. Um, we've had clients, I worked for a firm one time and the client wanted me to be their spokesperson during times of crisis. And I was like, it really needs to be someone from the organization representing the brand, representing the mission and the vision. And so, yeah, I don't even know how to, it, 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 no. I'll <laughs> say, uh, yeah, um, for us and for, um, it's very relevant in that I was raised by Myra Borshoff, as I like to say, um, because she was the go-to for crisis for so long and I've been here forever. Um, and I, you know, really learned in her shadow, but she served as the spokesperson a lot. It was kind of her thing. Um, and she was excellent at it and try and clients really trusted her with that, but that is not, I'm, I'm with Denise. It's not mm -hmm. how we do it now. Um, mm -hmm. and I think it's, you know, maybe a, a change of, of the world, but I think it's also just that idea of equipping somebody from the organization to be that we will issue statements. Sometimes mm -hmm. we will send press releases. I mean, we obviously are, we engage with the media coordination, so they know we're involved, mm -hmm. um, but we are usually equipping mm -hmm. uh, the people within the organization to be. I, I think there's also a level of objectivity that you have to maintain. And I think also, for lack of a better descriptor, there has to be a separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. There just has to be. And so once you start becoming a spokesperson, then you're part of the organization you know, from the public side. Whereas, you know, and they're already blurry anyway. And so now you're thrown into the mix. And so therefore you are perceived as being biased or being like the, the paid help or, you know, you're the consultant that came in. So you're not really as objective because now you're the spokesperson. So I just really think that not becoming a spokesperson keeps those lines of demarcation very, very clear and keep the roles very, very clear. And they also give the organization or the individual you've been brought in to help a higher level of accountability. You know, if you become the spokesperson, they can rest on you because once you start speaking, if it goes wrong, they can say, well, you didn't do it right. Yeah, so. it might also, I hadn't thought of this until now as you were saying that though, it's also just that whole metaphor of giving someone a fish or teaching them to fish. I mean, our yes, goal is to teach yes, people to fish. Our yes. goal is that you're not going to need us forever. Right. Um, you know, that we will come and go from this. We'd love to work with everybody forever, but mm -hmm. not necessarily in this capacity. Um, and I do think that that's probably a big difference uh, with how things have changed. And I know you said you have a question from Joe, so I'd love to hear that. I wanted to say that we also got a question that was just came to us in the chat. So I can add that after you do the other one. Great. Okay. So here's the question from Joe. What do you think of the nature of headlines, journalists, um, you know, in modern media where some outlets are looking for something that's clickable or breaking perhaps more so than substantive or thorough? I think this is a, this is a really good question, especially in this age of social media where the word choice that a journalist uses is, could sometimes feel very like, Ugh, problematic for you. What do, what do you think about that? Oh my goodness. That is a really good question. And it's funny because um, as was said in my introduction, I'm an adjunct professor at IUPUI and I teach intro to public relations. And it's so hard because everything is so sensationalized these days. And so I always, so here's the thing, we on our end as communicators can't do anything. Like it's out of our hands, but we can also utilize mediums so, so, such as social media to push the narrative that we need to push during a DEI crisis or any crisis for that matter to give some sort of counter to this sensational headline um, that, that is out there. Um, I also, and this is just a, a side note with, I mentioned the whole adjunct thing. That's why I tell my students, please, please, please read, like read. Please don't just rely on something that you saw on the internet, like to really do your fact checking and your reading. But of course, everyday people don't do that. You know, we're all very, this is what we do for a living. So we have a different perspective. But I think that 
with respect to headlines, you know, journalist reporters, it's a new dawn, it's a new day. The methods of how they gather news is very different now, but also the way that we tell our stories is very different now. So we can utilize those same platforms to push our narrative out, to try and counter those sensational headlines that may be out there in, in, in the public. A phrase I end up using a lot in these situations is we are just trying to bring the blood pressure down. Right. And that a lot of times we it is easy to get amped up that when the media sounds amped up and the reporter sounds amped up and everything about it and social media does. Our goal is to bring that all down to a reasonable because that's when people can make good decisions. That's when we can make this a longer play um, for where we get through. And it is hard. It is hard to ignore bad media about you. It's hard to ignore, you know, terrible headlines. It's hard to ignore dramatic quotes that come from people. Um, but if we can counter that with a reasonableness, I think you find that, you know, whatever you want to say, that 80% of the public that you can appeal to. Um, will see that that they're looking for you to are you a reasonable organization are you addressing this you don't have your head in the sand you're not in denial but you're also um not amping it up to be something i've only done a couple of celebrity crises like that is not our thing we don't usually represent individuals but i've been in two different situations with celebrity figures and that is such an amped up kind of thing and everybody's wants their attention and is piling on and saying it and in both cases, I saw the celebrity wanting to meet that with that amped up kind of messaging too. And both times I was like, no, no, no. If you want, is your goal less media on this? Then let's not go there. And if your goal is to not have everybody talking about this issue, you as a celebrity should definitely not be yeah. weighing in on it. Yeah, I literally, I was talking to Jennifer before we began this conversation that I literally had a former client who had some press written about them that wasn't very favorable, um, reached back to me and asked like, can I please call the newspaper and ask them to run another story? And I was thinking, I think that if you do that, you're going to escalate your situation. You know, you can't unring the bell or put the genie back in her bottle. It's out there, but what we can do is like you said, create messaging for you, you know, that you can use to, you know, put out there, but we can't unring that bell, nor should you try. Great point. That's a really great point. You can't take things back once they're out there. Okay, so we're getting close to the end of our time, but I wanted to give you an opportunity, Jennifer, if there was another question that you wanted to address as well, and then I'll close this out here in just a few minutes. Great. Yeah, Keisha asked, so many school districts are seeing opposition to creating DEI offices. How can these districts begin to create meaningful DEI change while they're also dealing with very vocal detractors. Oh my goodness, we should do a whole session on schools right now too. Mm -hmm. um, my husband just finished 12 years on school board and uh, wow, 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 wow. Uh, really, honestly, prayers for all schools and teachers and school board members and everything else. Um, I'm hoping that we're actually seeing a lot of districts more open to creating DEI offices and to creating more DEI positions. I know there are a lot out there right now in terms of postings and everybody's looking for that, which has its own challenges of, of people stepping into those roles. Um, but uh, this does seem to fall in the category of a very few vocal detractors. Um, mm -hmm. I know with some of the recent um, situations that they're finding that they were people who didn't have kids in the district were some of the most um, difficult people actually, you know, while it sounds like conspiracy theory, but some of these people truly were out of state um, people who come in and just make everything uh, difficult and want to make it look worse than it is, um, which is, you know, so intriguing. But um, I think I, I'm hoping, I'm sure as most of you are too, I'm hoping that this dialogue means that we are moving toward everybody having more real conversations and getting some more mm -hmm. um, real conversations about what's actually being taught in schools. How can we make sure all families and children feel seen? And where does that go into, you know, it sounds crazy, but to try to depoliticize mm -hmm. this so much and to make it just what's mm -hmm. best for the students and for the teachers um, and not about any kind of picking one side or the other from a politics standpoint. Um, so I would say, um, yeah, I think I think districts who aren't having DEI messages, that's probably going to change in time. I'm I'm old enough and doing this long enough as Denise and I always laugh that I, we sat with a university president who once said to us, you know, well, those things can't, don't happen. 
at our university. And I was like, do you have college students who are, you know, part of your, then these things are happening, you know, to, for you, that has changed a lot. People used to have their head in the sand. People are far more attuned now to things that can go wrong um, in their organizations. I think um, a plug for proactive crisis planning, um, you know, if you don't get help from us, get help somewhere. Um, that's what I would say. Um, you know, have a crisis plan that includes communications and do it when the adrenaline is not running. Do it when um, you can think clearly about different yeah. scenarios. Um, and, and DEI should definitely be part of that planning. Where are your vulnerabilities and what can you talk about when you're not actually under fire? Yeah, I think just to kind of add to that, I was going to suggest too that um, I think the communicator, while the communicator is definitely not the DEI consultant to the, the school districts, the, communi the communicator can definitely have some influence on, particularly from a crisis planning perspective, pointing out the fact that these are real things that could very well happen here, and we should be prepared for them, and we should be talking about them and thinking about how we can get ahead of them before they actually even happen, and that, that gives you that opportunity to at least have some influence on the subject matter, I would think. So thank you both, ladies. This has been a really great conversation. We're getting close to the end of our time together. So I just wanted to uh, kind of close us out by saying thank you to everyone for participating today. As I mentioned earlier, we will have a replay of today's session along with a summary blog on our social channels within the next week. And we will also send that out to you if you registered for the event as well. Um, we're also always looking for great new topics. So if you have a suggestion for something that you would like to hear more about, we would be very open to that and would love to hear your feedback. Um, and if you have any other thoughts for us um, going forward in the future, we just would, would love to hear it. So thank you again for joining us. We appreciate it. We will have another uh, shop chat uh, to close out the year uh, late in late October or early November. We're working up the date right now. Uh, so look for the information about that. And thank you again for joining us. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you.